Uh, I'm Chris Rogers. I'm the program director here at the Paul Robeson House Museum. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. We are grateful to play a role uh, in this year's the 2019 Black Lives Matter Week of Action, uh, which is organized with caucus working educators. We've got some caucus working educators folks in the back. Woo! Uh, um, this is the final event that was listed as part of this sort of like week long series. Um, that focused on racial justice in schools. Um, and it's been a whirlwind of a week. Not only here in Philly, but we've been doing this work nationally too. So um, in 30, uh, 30 different cities across the country, you're seeing a number of events that talk about the uh, power, demands, and uh, possibility of teachers um, working towards racial justice within education. And we know that this work sits uh, prime and center in uh, front of that story. Um, the Paul Robeson House, the history of the Paul Robeson House uh, is a project of the West Philadelphia Cultural Alliance, uh, which was led, if the, the door is still sort of like peaked open right now, but uh, Francis Alston, a community librarian here, um, began the West Philadelphia Cultural Alliance after the move bombing in West Philly mm -hmm. um, as a way to sort of pull together uh, West Philadelphia residents and families to think about arts as a tool, as a tool for social change. Uh, in the 90s, she was uh, she found about, out about this property, 4951 Walnut Street, that Paul Robeson spent the last 10 years of his life here, it was his sister's house, Marion Forsyth. Um, and since then, it's been a museum to honor Paul Robeson's legacy. We're, this year, we're doing a lot more research and work into uh, Paul Robeson's uh, less heralded like wife, the story is known as popular, but Eslanda Good Robeson. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work this year to also highlight her story as well. And the family story, um, which this kind of goes back to, and the, that goes back to all the way up until the time George Washington spent here in, in uh, Philadelphia. Um, so, a very historical house, but we also like really love that we're tied here residentially within the West Philadelphia community. Uh, so we can have folks like my neighbor over here and come down when we have events and really tie this community together. Um, so we're really excited about that and uh, really excited to host um, our authors and a book talk here today. Um, yeah, so we got some food, right? Food, yeah. food, there's food that's back there. Shout out to Hakeem's bookstore in the back. Yeah. Hakeem's Woo! is one of the oldest black bookstores on the East Coast. And they're a treasure here on 52nd Street. Please check them out if you're here in the city. Awesome collection. You got uh, Chris back there. Miss Yvonne was just here. I imagine she'll be back. Let me pass it on to Dr. Edwin Mayorga to introduce our guest for the day. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, my name is Edwin Mayorga. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in educational studies and Latin American and Latino studies at Swarthmore College um, and an affiliated member of the Caucus of Working Educators and uh, been active, hopefully, or supportive in the, the BLM week, a week of action. Um, uh, and so this is part of my contribution is to help organize and it was really just kind of the stars aligning um, with uh, um, uh, James <laughs> Saransky out, out there in the back there having a friend who was like, oh, I, you should talk to this dude. <laughs> There's this book. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so, um, uh, but we're, you know, really delighted. Um, I did want to also, as part of my practice, to recognize the land um, as Lene Lenape land and that, you know, as we are dialoguing and engaging in conversation here, um, that uh, we should never have that far from our hearts and our politics um, and as we understand the intersections of race, education, and, and so forth um, with our guests and, and in the book, none of the above. Um, the other thing is I also want to just thank um, uh, the Caucus of Working Educators, um, Hakeem's, um, the Paul Robeson House, um, as well as Swarthmore College and um, its various um, entities that have, you know, um, contributed to supporting the event that we had earlier today at Swarthmore and our event here um, at the Robeson House. So, um, without any further ado, um, I just wanted to <clears throat> briefly just kind of intro the conversation a little bit, um, and it's going to be more con you know conversational, and I'll I'll ask a few questions, but also want to leave it open to um, our audience, our community here, as we're building community, um, to also jump in with questions and. Um, you know, really it's about 
um, Shani and, and Anna's, um, uh, you know, narrative and, and what they've, they've, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears that they, you know, put into this, you know, <laughs> um, and Shani's in particular, I think that's what became, I was speaking to some colleagues earlier, earlier today after the talk at Swarthmore, and it was, I think, the devastation and pain, but also the, the acts of, of, of resistance that I think um, were, we were so struck by um, this more, or this earlier afternoon, um, and so, um, so hopefully we can kind of continue that kind of vibe and that kind of conversation and dialogue, both in Atlanta and through Shawnee's story, but also um, through our own work here in Philadelphia and, um, and beyond. So, um, But uh, the title of our conversation here is Teaching While Black Should Not Be a Crime, a book conversation with Shawnee Robinson and Anna Simonton. Um, Across the country over the past year, public school teachers have been striking for better working conditions, better pay, um, as we see in Denver today. Um, uh, but most importantly, a better, more equitable education for all of our students. Uh, the fight has been brewing for decades, and a new book, um, None of the Above, shines a light on the intertwined injustices of systemic racism, high-stakes testing, and co corporate overreach in U.S. public schools that led to 35 educators of color in Atlanta, uh, <clears throat> being slapped with felonies for allegedly changing students' answers on standardized tests. None of the above, the untold story of the Atlanta public schools cheating scandal, um, <clears throat> sorry, the Atlanta public schools cheating scandal, corporate greed, and the criminalization of educators is an honest and courageous account of Shawnee's experience. A former educator whose life, who, whose life continues to be turned upside down for a crime she did not commit. The book links Shani's personal experiences to the political historical context to, to set the stage for the cheating scandal, and, and hopefully we'll be able to explore some of that in the conversation, um, and explores how racist policies and practices cheated generations of black and brown children long before some, some teachers tampered with tests as it continues today. Um, so I'm pleased to be joined by our co-authors, Shani Robinson, um, alumna of Tennessee State um, University, hey. taught in Atlanta for three years, um, and is currently an advocate for troubled youth and their families, and Anna Simonton, who's an independent journalist and an editor for Scalawag, <coughs> Scalawag Magazine. Um, her work's been published in The Nation, In These Times, and Alternate, among other um, locations. So, um, yeah, welcome both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to start um, similarly to um, our conversation um, earlier today uh, with the opening of the book, which is really your story, Shani, um, your personal story, what brought you into teaching. So um, could you share with, uh, with all of us a little bit of that? So um, my mother was a second generation school teacher, and I remember helping her as a child, um, tutoring some of her students. And so that passion of teaching has always been there. I did not major in um, teaching or anything like that. Um, but I double majored in psychology and African studies. And I, um, I was interested in journalism. So I started working at a, um, a local news station. And before I could really pursue a career in journalism, I was recruited by Teach for America. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with Teach for America. But I was about 23 years old. You know, I was, I want to save the world, you know. <laughs> um, and I, I really didn't know a lot about education or politics at that time. But I felt like it was aligned with um, what I believed with Any Child Can Learn. Um, I was very passionate. And so through the program, I relocated back to Atlanta. Because I was like, where am I going to go? And I said, I'll go back to Atlanta. Um, and so I taught in Atlanta Public Schools for three years. My second year teaching, which later becomes the year in question, I'll just jump right into how I was dragged into all of this. I was a first grade teacher. And as a first grade teacher, um, my test scores actually did not count toward the district targets or the um, the national standards, which is what we call adequate yearly progress, and that's like for the entire country. Um, so there were two different set of, of benchmarks, but all first through eighth grade students had to take what's called the CRCT, the Criterion Reference Competency Test. It was um, a standardized test that everyone had to take. So on the last day of testing, my second year teaching, I was called into a computer lab to erase stray marks from my students' test booklets. 
Um, Six-year-olds, when they take a test, they, uh, you know, scribble <laughs> on their um, their test book list. They were drawing detailed pictures, and you know, one boy like fell out of his chair during the middle of the test um, because they're six-year-olds having to sit for hours, which is why I think it's ridiculous for six-year-olds to have to take a test in the first place. Um, but they didn't even count. So while in the computer lab. Um, we were erasing stray marks and um, fixing some illegible handwriting on our students in the students' demographic session section because some of it was sloppy. So there were first and second grade teachers in the computer lab and the testing coordinator. So I was in there for about 20 minutes, handed my test booklets back to the testing coordinator, and then I thought that was the end of the story. You know, it was like another boring round of testing. Shawnee, um, it's, so it's legal to... It's written in the testing manual to erase your student straight marks. And it was something that was done every year. So I didn't think anything of it. Um, so fast forward to October of 2010. I taught for three years and then I resigned um, to work for a counseling agency. I worked with children who were in DFACS custody and DJJ custody, Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, so I, look, I work with a lot of foster um, children. And so I get a call from a GBI agent, Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Mm. And I'd never been um, questioned by any type of law enforcement. So when he asked to meet me, I'm like, oh yeah, sure, no attorney. You know, I'm just like, yeah, where do you want me to meet? You know. Um, where did he want you to meet them? Oh, so we met in a mall parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> Is that so, like dude down there? Or? <laughs> so the mall, there was like a mall that was like three miles away from my house. And coincidentally, the headquarters of the GBI is like right in that same area too. It was just a coincidence. Um, but we met in the, um, the mall parking lot. And so he basically, act, he told me that there had been an erasure analysis done. And we'll get more into what happened. But basically, there was an erasure analysis done for the entire state of Georgia, not just for the school district that I work. It was for the entire state of Georgia. But he told me that in my class specifically, there were high levels of wrong erasures. And he asked me, could I explain this? And I said, no, I can't explain this. Um, and then he was asking me, did my um, principal or testing coordinator ever place any pressure on me to change my students' um, answer sheets? And I said, no. And then he pulls out this um, pre-written voluntary statement form for me to sign. He asked me, will I sign? And so the form is basically saying, you don't have any knowledge about cheating. You didn't cheat. And so it, w it said voluntary. So technically, I didn't have to sign. But it was, you know, I didn't have anything to hide. Here is a GBI agent asking me to sign this form. And so I agreed and I signed. Now the thing about this form is that that same day that the um, agent interviewed me, there were they went into the schools and teachers were pulled from their classrooms, and so that's why they had to interview me in a mall parking lot. I was no longer working for the school system, so teachers were pulled and interrogated. There were no attorneys present, and many of them signed the form. Later. Some teachers were charged with false statements and writings for signing this form, which is a felony. So you have teachers who didn't really have an attorney present, sign this form because you have the GBI um, telling you to sign this form. And so later it's kind of hard in court to even argue, well, why did you all sign the form that was voluntary? You know, it's kind of like we were put between a rock and a hard place. Um, and so I guess from there, we're well, going to get into So those felonies, like the false statements of writing, became the underlying charge um, for the RICO charges. Mm -hmm. And that's what blew this case out of proportion compared to anything anywhere else, was yeah. that um, RICO is wrecking conspiracy, and it carries a minimum sentence of, or possible sentence of 20 years. Yeah, and so maybe you want to talk about um, the day that you found out that you were on that indictment. Right. So, Good Friday of 2013. <laughs> um, and by this time, um, we had heard that like news about the cheating scandal had already been out um, for a couple of years, but no one had been charged. 
Um, and let me just say before I get into that, as far as the widespread cheating is concerned, over 40 states in this country have had allegations of cheating. 14 of those states has yeah. is, is been determined to be widespread. In Washington, D.C., there were 103 schools flagged for suspiciously high test scores. So this was something that was not just happening in Atlanta. This was happening all over the country. So clearly something systemic is happening that needs to be addressed. Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> Good Friday. Oh, that's right. Good Friday. Good Friday. <laughs> oh, the best Friday. Of the best Friday. So I was carpooling. And thank goodness I was not driving that day because I would have driven off the road. But thank goodness I was not driving. Um, and so my husband calls me and says, you were just indicted in the cheating scandal. And I was like, what? You know, um, he said, I saw your name scrolling across the bottom of the screen of the news. That's how I found out wow. from the news station telling me that I had until, you know, um, I don't know if it was that Monday to turn myself in. I found out from the news. So, um, right, no one knew. And so, it was, it, shortly after that, there was a lot of media coverage. It blew up in the media. Um, they, we were turned into like public enemies overnight. I didn't even know what racketeering was. I had heard about it, like watching the Sons of Anarchy one time. I had associated <laughs> it with the cartel. And I'm like, surely they did not charge me with racketeering. I didn't even get any money. So. I, to get bonus money, this is what the whole uh, RICO was like, the premise, because if schools met what was called the district targets, bonus money was given out. So the, the entire school might have gotten maybe $500 or $1,000 or, um, you know, $2,000, something like that. Um, my school, we didn't meet our targets. We didn't get any money. And my, I taught first grade, so my test scores didn't even count. So I never cheated, I never received any money, and my test scores did not even count, and I was charged with racketeering in false statements and writings, which carries a 25-year prison sentence. Mm. Um, some of my co-defendants were facing up to 40 years in yeah. prison, and these are teachers and administrators. Um, at the same time that the governor sent in special investigators to the schools, um, to you know how the, the DBI came and we were all interrogated, he used those same questionable scores in an application for a four hundred million dollar federal race of the top grant. And so the state received four hundred million dollars, even though twenty percent of the schools in Georgia were inflated. Most of my co-defendants did not receive anything. If they did, it might have been like the five hundred dollars or the thousand dollars, something like that. Um, so to charge us with racketeering, it was really an overreach. And the way it was interpreted in our case was that um, two people who might not have known each other, they could have been working in different schools, if they had similar actions or intents, could be in a conspiracy. So two people could be in a conspiracy that didn't know they were conspiring. That was the, yeah, total overreach to interpret it that way in order to be able to charge teachers with this. Right. Um, I was wondering, I mean, it all sounds ludicrous to me, uh, yeah. but uh, but in the, in the book, um, you all go into um, really a kind of wonderful, um, uh, and succinct, I like, I like succinct, <laughs> you know, a wonderful and succinct kind of, um, discussion of, of con contextualizing um, testing and what was happening um, in relation to both Atlanta and the kind of larger U.S. kind of trajectories around education. I was wondering if either one of you could talk a little bit about the context and, and what you saw through the lens of, of, um, of the scandal. Yeah. Do you want um, and you mean as far as like well, high stakes testing or yeah I mean either the high stakes testing or um, uh, I'm thinking about both kind of like the racial and economic kind of politics of, of Atlanta in particular um, I don't know if yeah. I want to can talk about that like, yeah let me reframe it that way <laughs> yeah no I mean we go back to Brown versus Board of Education um, to really look at how the white backlash to school desegregation started this trajectory with um, you know, white parents looking for ways to privatize public education so that they no longer, so that they could use public funds 
to send their children to all yes. white schools, right? Yes. So, so this is happening everywhere, but in Atlanta, um, that is playing out, and um, so this disinvestment, it sort of sets the stage for a larger disinvestment from public goods and public, the public sector. Um, and so we have conservatives through that period of time, and liberals, honestly, um, saying that, you know, we need more market-driven, <laughs> so we, we need the market to drive things like education. Um, and that, throughout the 80s, sort of brings us to this point of saying, of folks saying, we don't want to throw all this money into education if we don't know what the outcomes, if we don't know that we're getting the outcomes that, that we should. So how do we hold schools accountable? So these ideas are starting to form around accountability, around school choice, um, and that sort of starts to play into the charter school movement um, later on. But in the early 90s, the focus on accountability led to um, a push towards standardized testing as a way to say, no matter where you are in the country, we can apply these same tests and um, find out if schools are doing what they should be doing. Um, in school districts like Houston, the superintendent there started to apply uh, incentives to schools that would do better. So there's this increasing pressure to raise test scores. Um, and states that did that, uh, there were some federal incentives for that, that gradually sort of these things that were being tried out culminated in 2001 with No Child Left Behind, which was the federal legislation that said all these things that we've been trying throughout the 90s in terms of um, handing out bonus money to schools where test scores go up and sanctioning schools where test scores aren't rising, we're going to make that um, federal policy. And between 2001 and 2014, we're saying that all schools have to make sure that students are proficient in reading and math by the year 2014. And what that looks like is that you have to meet adequate yearly progress, or AYP, um, by increasing your test scores every year, which is <laughs> a mission impossible because you have different students every year. So if 80% of your students pass one year, um, and you're required to make sure that 83% pass the next year, but you have a whole new group of students, that might not happen. There's a very good chance that won't happen. And so that's where we start to see the, the sort of widespread cheating that Shani talked about is becoming very commonplace. Um, and at the same time, we have this sort of burgeoning education market um, where charter schools were first legalized in the early 90s um, and had some really good intentions behind them. It was like a teacher's union leader that came up with this idea of you know, giving teachers more creative control. But that begins to be co-opted during that time period um, by a sort of plethora of companies that are um, offering services for contract and charter schools have less oversight and so they can do a lot more with the education funds that they're allocated um, that a traditional school might not do. And, um, so those are some of the things that are starting to shape the, the context in which the cheating scandal happened. Um, and then there's some things specific to Atlanta that we may go into, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that kind of get it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and I actually was wondering a little bit um, uh, more specifically to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because in the book you... you, you well, interestingly, and, and you mentioned it in, the, in our conversations earlier today at, the, at, the, at Swarthmore, that um, the way um, the white and black kind of elite, mm. um, the dynamics between them and control of the city, um, I, thought, I thought that was a really interesting point and wondered actually if you could talk a little bit about that and what, how that connects to the schools and what was happening in Atlanta specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was well, Atlanta is known as the city too busy to hate, <laughs> and so it's all about image. Um, historically, black and white elite worked together to keep the business community flowing, make sure that you know there's no racial tensions um, that are going to hurt anything, mm -hmm. and so um, what tends to happen is it's almost in a sense of if you can kind of like scapegoat people for certain things or if you can make a situation look like it's black on black crime you know you're really not going to have and we and don't get me wrong we have people to come out different mentality, different mentality. It, it seems hard it seems it seems challenging i don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on everything else is a challenge um, um, 
so, so, so I'm ready for, I'm this, ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was built, and I was built for this. this. I think that, I think we, that all we all have a purpose in life. In life. And mine's is going to take on a test that most that most of back away back from. Away from. That impossible, that impossible. So people, people say it's impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see anything as being impossible.